in the, when you enter the real world, just say yes to everything. If someone asks you to go out to an event, say yes. If someone asks you for a meeting, say yes. You will just come across some really interesting experiences and people. And when you're young, like the opportunity cost is quite low. In 1837, Horace Mann created the education system, a system at the time designed to pump out factory workers and professors. The same system that is still being used today in the 21st century. Now, Man's system is backfiring. We are being molded by the same industrial system that has existed for close to 200 years. That system delivers us into a digital economy that has no need of our outdated skills. This isn't our teacher's fault. This isn't the government's fault. This is due to a rapidly changing world full of technology and unforeseen circumstances. And us Gen Zs are caught in the middle. Welcome to the Driven Young Podcast, the podcast for stressed, overwhelmed young Australians, teaching you practical life skills you can implement now to set yourself up in life. And now your host, Byron Dempsey. Welcome back to the Driven Young Podcast, and today I'm joined by 22-year-old Taj Babari. Taj is one of Australia's youngest and most successful social entrepreneurs. He is the CEO of the Australian School of Entrepreneurship, or ASE, a social enterprise that helps develop the entrepreneurial skills of school students, young entrepreneurs, and anyone aged 5 to 21 years old with a passion for innovation. ASE has partnered with the government, the private sector, and educational institutes to deliver real and authentic entrepreneurial education for more than 90,000 students. In 2017, Taj was awarded Young Australian of the Year for Queensland. He is the youngest recipient of the award since its formation in 1979. So you can see Taj is a legend and is a perfect fit for the Driven Young podcast. And today we are talking about how Taj started his own businesses, an incredible way to grow your network using a coffee strategy we've discussed before, how to meet new people, how to start your own micro business today, how you can actually start today with practical tips that we teach, what skills he teaches in his program, and so much more. A special shout out to the sponsor of today's episode, Student Edge. They've put together an incredible online program teaching life skills for young people, such as communication skills, money and finance skills, entrepreneurship, and more. A lot of what I teach on this show, but in a different format. They also provide heaps of other services and give you access to discounts and vouchers so you can get free McDonald's burgers, boba tea, and a lot more. Check them out at studentedge.org. As per usual, please DM me or Taj if you enjoy this episode. If you are in Sydney, please come along to my Gappy Information Night. I think you'll get so much out of it. It's happening every Tuesday night. Get a copy of my book, 18 and Lost So Are We, and take the Are You Ready for Uni quiz. Also, if you do enjoy this episode, Taj actually teaches one of the entrepreneurship courses on the Student Edge platform. So if you want to hear more from him, you can go check that out. Links are in the show notes below. Now, over to Taj. Okay. Taj, welcome so much to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it, mate. Yeah, I'm, I'm stoked for this episode. Um, another young entrepreneur here. Um, you've built something incredible um, with this business. It's helping young people. Just off camera, we were talking about the alignment there is between what we're doing and hopefully we can uh, you know, partner up in the future. But before we jump into, I guess, entrepreneurship and talking about life skills we should be learning and what you're seeing in the, working with you know, 10,000, 20,000 plus young people, I'd love to know your story. Specifically, what did you do when you finished high school? What was going on in your head? Were there pressures from your parents, et cetera? And what are you currently up to right now? Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, high, like, I hated school, um, like primary school in particular was like just, I think I was on three or four suspensions by grade four. Um, and at my <laughs> school, that was probation. Um, so like just through primary school in particular, like looking back, I think the dots just didn't connect. I, I was a nerd. I um, wore these big glasses when um, I, I absolutely loved tech. Um, when people used to ask me, hey, Tard, what do you want to do when you grow up? My response was technology. I um, I loved it. I was immersed in it. It made me excited. Um, and that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, but school at the time was um, <laughs> didn't want to let me use a computer all day. And mum and dad certainly didn't want me doing that either. And got into a lot of trouble, um, realized that business was kind of cool when I was in grade four as well um, and had this cool tech blog. Um, and that was my first taste of business. I was writing like reviews about the latest electronics, um, which was great. Like I created this like blogspot website, which was on like 40,000 viewers per day. Um, really? And it was epic. Like I was paying nothing for advertising, wasn't paying anything for the domain either. <laughs> Um, and Google was just sending me traffic. Um, and like I was 11, um, which was just epic. Um, cause I met, like, I learned that 
like from a really young age that uh, I have there is a life outside of school, um, mm. which which we we know at this age um, there is, but at that age, you your parents say school's important, your teachers say school's important, you go there five days a week for eight hours a day. Of course, you think it's important, yeah. um, but we have especially at in that school age the time and the mental capacity um to do a whole lot more um so had a business quite young um long story short i finished school with um, a pretty cool business it was called 56 creations and we were teaching kids about digital literacy um and uh, really after school i mum and dad were convinced that um as long as i knew what i was doing they were happy for me to to be in business and and do what I was doing um, was I was doing it since I was in primary school um, and kind of went went on and started another business from from there. But really, life outside of school was incredible. I spent a year out in a year in New York, straight out of at school. Thought, what is one place that I really want to go to that I wasn't allowed to go to in school for an extended amount of time? And the hub was New York, so I did that for a year and ran my business um, out of New York, out of the Google office um, there, which was epic. Um, and now just, yeah, running running the ASC group, teaching kids about how to start their own business. Man, that's that's insane. I can't I can't get over the blog part, 40,000. Like, obviously, that was in a time where blogging was much more popular and you were probably, <laughs> you know, an innovator in terms of you adopted it very early, but that's insane. 40,000 views a day at 11 years old. That is... Um, that's crazy. And it's crazy that you had that realization at such a young age. Like for me, I was probably 16, 17 when I started listening to podcasts and going, oh my God, there is so much more to life than school. Like this, so, And that was when I went, okay, business is a huge opportunity similar to you. So mm. like, what, did you find, did you have any pushback when you started the business? Was, was anyone just like th- <laughs> thinking you're weird? Were your parents supportive? Like what was that process like? Look, I, so as I said, I got into a lot of trouble in school and for teachers, like they were just quite happy that I wasn't doing naughty things in the classroom. So for me to be sitting at the back of the room on my laptop, um, they like, honestly, I got a year of just doing blogs at the back of the classroom with no one really interrupting me. So it was fantastic. Um, it was great. Um, my, um, I don't think I even had the awareness of business at the time, to be honest, Byron. I think um, like I, like I was a nerd. I really loved <laughs> tech um, instead of just, like the best way of learning is by teaching. And um, like, I really, really wanted to learn everything and anything about technology. Um, so my outlet of doing that was by uh, going to JB Hi-Fi on a weekend. Um, and like every single weekend, um, I would be like my sister. I had a very academic sister that loved co-curriculars. And she was the type of kid that would go to every co-curricular on a weekend and I would just be getting C, like I was a C grade, D grade nerd. So not a very clever one, but um, absolutely loved electronics. And when she'd be dropped to her co-curriculars, uh, I'd get mum and dad to drop me to JB Hi-Fi or Harvey Norman. And I'd just spend mm-hmm. hours in there. Um, and that was my idea of fun. I absolutely yeah. loved it. I played, like I felt the, the edges. I'd play with the hinges of electronics. Um, and the tech blog was my outlet. Um, it never started as a business. It was purely a passion project. Um, and it ended up turning into uh, an awesome following. I had lots of, like, I was so young that the articles I was writing were so basic. And the people who were reading my articles were old people. They were old people who just wanted to know the bare basics about the technology yeah. they were buying. Um, then Google put ads on the website and we were getting like $10 a day from ads. <laughs> um, which was epic. Um, on weekends, I'd, when I'd go to these department stores, I'd be clicking on all my ads. So we'd be getting $150 on a weekend. Um, and it was just like, it started as a passion. I um, it purely was um, an outlet for me to um, to, to share my passion um, for, for electronics. And after that, it was, it turned into a cool business. It turned into me getting touch off every day, which was kind of cool. That's awesome, man. Well, so does 56 Creations, does that still exist or has that now, you finished that up and you moved on to something else? Yeah, look, I moved on. Um, the organization still runs. Um, we, uh, well, 56 Creations delivers digital literacy programs for school students. Um, when I left the organization, um, we ended up getting some funding to deliver uh, digital programs for senior Australians. And I absolutely love my grandparents, but if you had to ask me, do I have a passion for senior Australians? The answer would be no. Um, mm. I was really interested in uh, teaching young people uh, about future skills. 
Um, but 56 Creations was um, kind of on this role of teaching digital literacy skills to like really young people and then really old people. Um, and at that stage, I thought it was time for me to move on. And we've now got some really passionate people who absolutely love old people. Um, and that's great. Um, and that organization um, still, still rolls um, delivering workshops and, and online programs. Yeah, nice, man. Well, that's, you know, huge achievements uh, at such a young age. And, you know, you're paving the way for the future of young people, which is awesome to see. Um, but let's have a chat about what you teach in your workshop. So obviously, um, similar to me, you know, the tagline of this podcast is I teach practical life skills we should have learned in school, skills such as entrepreneurship, money and finance, relationships, um, sex, sex education. Um, I think there's so much stuff we should have been learning in school that we don't in a it blows my mind. Um, I know you agree, but what are you guys teaching in your workshops and what are you most passionate about when it comes to teaching young Australians these skills or just young people in general? Yeah, definitely. Well, we kind of look at, um, we recently did a piece of research on the um, in, in, on, on future of work. And when we generally talk about the future of work, people talk about digital skills. Um, and like, I think I, I agree in principle, digital skills are important. Um, but there's a lot of emphasis that gets placed onto coding um, and computer programming. And um, maybe 10 years ago, uh, that might have been a, a fair emphasis. Um, computer programmers, junior computer programmers were paid a huge amount of money. Uh, but as we enter the innovation economy, an innovation economy that doesn't really care about what we know, but what we do with what we know, uh, yeah. that requires people skills, human skills. Um, there are already systems right now that code themselves. And right now, schools uh, are placing this huge emphasis on teaching kids digital skills. So as part of the work we do at the ASE Group, through the Australian School of Entrepreneurship and the Australian School of Employment, um, we like to teach human skills. Um, these skills have been around forever. They're nothing new, um, but skills that w we don't get taught in the classroom. Um, like you, you mentioned, uh, financial literacy skills. Um, earlier, I think um, in school, like in my first year out of school, I was running a business when I was uh, really quite young. And in my first year out of the school, when I had to fill out an income tax return, um, I ended up picking up a fine. Um, in school, we didn't even learn about the importance of or how to fill out a tax return. Um, right. What is a tax I was return? A, I was the same. I was running a business straight out of high school. And it's so confusing. I went from sole trader to company and I was like, wait, yeah. now I've got to pay my tax. I've got to pay GST and Bass. And I was like, what? now obviously we don't have to train kids because not everyone's going to start a business, but I had no idea what I was doing. Absolutely Basically, no idea. Because we spend so much time in trying to solve, uh, like in, in what, I'm not sure how much time you spent on long division, but this was in my suspension days. And um, like I was a consistent C and D student, um, but we spent this huge time learning about long division and, uh, trying to solve the elusive mystery of what is X, and we forgot about teaching our young people about uh, how does how do interest rates work? How does compound mm. interest work? Yeah, um, like these are core skill for every single young person to learn and understand. Yeah, yet we don't get taught them. And like I mentioned to you at Empower You, this event I run, the first work, the first like section I started doing was the money and finance section, and you know I've had people like, oh no, how can you teach that? You you know you're not qualified. It's like I'm just teaching the basics. You don't yeah. have to be an expert. I just teach the importance of, we teach compound interest. We teach the importance of um, delayed gratification. Like that's a whole section of the money and finance, the flow of money. You know, um, you've got gross tax, income tax, you know, how do you save different bank accounts? Just the bare basics because kids don't even know that. Absolutely. Like I think um, like school was there to prepare us for the real world. Um, we look now at uh, what we teach and teachers want to teach these skills. Yes. Uh, but they're restricted. They're handcuffed yes. by this overcrowded curriculum. Um, and instead of teaching young people about the core skills, like if you don't know about your taxes, you will be fine. If you do not know how to fill out, if, or if you, in the first instance, and I made this mistake, if you don't fill out an income tax return in the first place, you will be fined. Um, mm. This is a skill for every single young Australian, regardless of what industry or career pathway they go down, they need these skills. Um, yeah. Some of the skills we're forced to learn in school are skills that, well, yeah, they might be useful at some point, but not every kid needs to learn them. Kind of fine, though, when, when I went through even starting a business, we get most, a, a lot of young people won't go on and start a business and that's okay. Um, but there are a set of basic adulting 101 skills every single young person needs. And those yeah. are the skills that we teach um, through the ASC group. And we yeah. do that both face-to-face -face and online. We um, kind of focus it on 
um, with the really young kids, so as young as five um, or back to 24. Um, and we find the best way of teaching these adulting skills is by teaching young people about how to start a business. And as we know, when you start a business, you become a jack of all trades. Um, yeah. As an employee, you might be specializing in a particular area, but as an entrepreneur, you have to do a bit of everything. And that's what makes you uh, a really great entrepreneur and can make you a really great employee, even if you don't want to start a business in the future. Um, yeah. So we teach these adulting 101 skills through entrepreneurship. And like starting a business, you're exactly right. You have to be jack of all trades. I had to learn about accounting. I had to learn about marketing. I had to learn about how to do sales, how to communicate with people. I had to, I'm, I do everything. I still, I'm not everything, but I still, you know, post or manage all my social media content. I do videography. Like I've learned so many skills because you're forced to. And it's forced, incredible. You know, it puts you in a position where you have to do it. And it's like, all right. The other thing it does is it teaches you huge amount of discipline because you go from a structured eight hour day where you're told everything you have to do you have to ask go to the toilet suddenly i can sleep until three o'clock if i want and there's no immediate consequences because no one's in charge of me but obviously it's going to hurt the business long term and so it, it developed this huge level of self-discipline um where it's just like you know it's it's so important because i feel like we do lack discipline through you know, just young people like discipline in general through school, through technology, through everything that's giving us instant gratification. And Byron, when you take these skills that you've learned from a business and you go into employment, you are, you are probably the best employee in that oh, workplace because absolutely. you are a jack of all trades. You've created that discipline. You are self-accountable. You, you've got habits that work for you. Um, and these are skills you learn from being self-employed. And that's why we yeah. teach these skills because – Someone who is self-employed or someone who started a business in the past is the most employable person um, because yeah. they've been there and done that. They've tried everything. They know a bit about everything. Um, and to me, that makes really the most all-rounded uh, employee. Absolutely. And like I get a lot of people who reach out to me. Um, they're like, Byron, I've been listening to your podcast now for six months and I want to start a business instead of going to uni. Like, Do you, do you recommend this? And I, I always say yes because here's the thing. Statistically, you're probably going to fail. But that's okay. In fact, it's good. And no one starts a business. No one, you know, what is it? The average successful entrepreneur had five failed businesses, right? Um, you know, no one starts a first business and it kicks off. But you're going to learn so much in the process. You're going to develop so many skills that once you finish that or fail your project, you're going to be so much more employable, as you mentioned, and the benefits are going to be huge. So even though someone could be like, well, Byron, my son failed, you know, you, they shouldn't have taken your advice. Well, actually, I think they would have learned so much in that process and they can still go to uni now it's not like they've missed out and the, the, the people they've met the networks they've been able to tap into yeah um the, it, it really is a world on its own and um I, I i agree like nothing when you start a business the business might not fail but you uh, you are the ceo of your personal corporation and your personal corporation uh, has either got new connections has got new experiences um, and in that sense, that's a, a massive, overwhelming success, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, the analogy I use is like, if you imagine a video game, like an open world video game, like Skyrim or something. And as you know, when you're in an open world game, you level up your character. And so every time, let's say you've got your main, your main quest in the video <laughs> game is like what it, your, your business, what your passion is, right? But every now and then you do side quests. Now, side quests don't contribute to the main quest, like a business you might start and it might fail, but you've leveled yourself up. You've you've gained all these skills, and these skills are going to transfer over into the main quest. And so, rather than thinking of it, oh, as I failed, well, actually, no, you know, failure is just an opportunity for growth and to learn. And you now have really great skills. And it's it's so true. Like my mum is an occupational therapist, and she's got a mm -hmm. occupational therapy business. And she wants when she's hiring someone, you know, she's interviewed people who their only skill is being an OT. They mm. don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to use computers. She used to train them how to use Mac software and like set up an iPhone like they're freaking children. And so she, she doesn't employ those people. She employs all these women who know what they're doing. And even my sister who's been working for her has been so valuable to her because she, she knows how to use Canva. She knows how to do all these skills that are super valuable to have in the workplace. Absolutely. And like Jan Owen, the former CEO of the Foundation for Young Australians, talks about learning. Uh, failing up or fucking up whilst learning. And I think yeah. uh, the idea of um, like in, in school, we, we've obviously got a very black and white, have you failed, have you passed? Um, and then we've got A, B, C, D, E's that follow it. Um, the idea that like failure is totally cool, right? That That's what school is for. We, we've now like we put place this huge emphasis and it's 
destroying the mental health of some of the, some young people that school is like is the exam but school is to prepare you for the real world yeah um school is not the the be all end all you don't need a grades and if you don't get an a grade you're you're a failure school is there to prepare you um you're only there from nine to three um if you get c grades and you pass and you've got a business outside of that that's fantastic um but the idea that um, we need to encourage that learning mentality um, and obviously reflecting at the end of it as well, um, ultimately really will create a, a, a pipeline of really incredible young people that don't have an issue with taking risks and, and giving things a go. Absolutely. I mean, couldn't agree more. And uh, I mean, let's switch gears and go a bit more practical. So like, okay, Byron and Taj, that's great. I believe you, but how do I get into this? Of course, you have programs and I'm sure any listeners here can get involved in. Um, but how do you get started in business and what are the first skills you'd like to teach? And do you just encourage, what sort of businesses do you encourage people to start? Yeah, definitely. All right. So um, when we, to, in, in response to your last part of the question, we really think, especially for the young people that are just dabbling in business to learn skills start a micro business um so when we talk about micro this is not something that's going to change the world this is a very practical uh, realistic business idea in the most simplest form this could be a gardening business this could be a uh, a car washing business this could be a uh, babysitting business um, something very practical um, the reason we think practical businesses are, are, the, are the or micro businesses are the way to go is they're a lot easier to start. You don't need huge amounts of money to start them. Um, mm. And you can actually get this up and running really quickly. And that's what we do with a lot of our young people. Um, we get them to identify a local problem. Um, and this might, like, it could be a, like a social problem or it could be there's not enough babysitters in our community. Therefore, we're going to start a babysitting business and we're going to charge right. a bit less than the, the current people, but find a market need and solve it. Uh, and you can well, do like that a, instantaneously. Like a dog walking business or something. Right. Very simple, very practical, um, post them to a couple of Facebook community groups and you can generally yeah. find customers um, because you learn a lot in business, not by starting a business and by pitching your idea, but by actually executing on it, by talking yeah. to your customers, by delivering on your product or service. Um, the delivery is where you learn, not in the start. Um, and even if you've got the crappiest idea on the planet um, and no one, and like it's, it's, it's the delivery um, of your business or social change idea or product or service that leads to the biggest uh, learning growth. Um, so find like what is a local problem, uh, brainstorm a solution. In regional Australia, you've got so many problems um, and a lot of our work is done in regional Australia. Um, there's so many problems to solve um, and micro business can be the solution to a lot of these problems. Um, go and talk to people. Uh, as soon as yeah. you've got that problem and solution, um, like I – from a really young age, during my school holidays, um, most school holidays, sorry, every school holidays and most days of my school holidays, I would be getting a bus to the city um, and taking people out for coffee. I got onto LinkedIn when I was really young and I'd just be messaging random people that looked really cool and said, hey, can I buy you a coffee? And I'd just be buying these people coffees during the day just to meet them. I talked to them mm. about my, um, my idea, which was the tech blog at the time, um, and I'd just be talking to them about uh, my my business and throw it to them. Hey, what are you doing? Um, and in most m most times or not, these people want to help young people and they want to give back. They want to see this as an opportunity to give back. Um, and we'll introduce you to two more people along the way as well. Yeah. And I had this massive network before I turned sixteen of people all around the country um, and even people interstate. I'd just be saying, when you're in Brisbane, I'd love to love to catch up. And after school, I'd get a bus to the city or or the valley and just catch up with these guys and um it was fantastic because i built this network um, and even though my idea changed or my business had changed i had this community i had this network of people that had known me when i was 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 i built the rapport with them over years um and finally when the business that uh that could have been relevant to their area or industry came by i had a relationship with these people um, yeah. And that started with a micro business, which for me was a tech blog, um, nothing special, nothing um, complicated um, and turned into something quite incredible there, there on. And that's exactly how I met my first investor. Um, he was based in Sydney. He came to Brisbane. I met him after school. Um, we caught up and he invested into my business before I turned 16. Um, and that really came from a random connection on LinkedIn of me asking him for coffee. 
mate, I cannot, that, that is such a great little section there. I hope people understand um, how valuable that was. And it's, it's come up a few times. Like I've, I've challenged people to get, get one coffee with someone every week. And, and what, what is important to notice is you have to go to them and you have to buy them coffee and you have to don't make it as easy as possible. I've had people reach out to me like, Hey, Byron, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to meet you. And I said, yeah, there's a cafe near where I work. Do you want to meet there? And they're like, oh, it's pretty far for me. Do you want to meet here? And I'm like, are you kidding me? That's going to be like a 45 minute trip. It's like, I don't even know who you are with respect. If you want to, and you know, it's kind of, it's just the fundamentals, make it as easy for, as possible. I've done it as well. I've, dri I've driven, you know, 45 minutes into the city just to meet someone for like 20 minutes and have a coffee with them. And nothing's happened from it. So exactly. Sometimes nothing will happen. Mm. Yeah, nine out of ten times, nothing will happen. But it's the one, the one in ten or one in a hundred or whatever, where you get the investor or you get the whoever it is that introduces you to this person. Blah 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 blah, and then you're off. Absolutely, and, so and as long as your sample size is high enough, like of course, yeah. if you meet one and it's useless, you know, and you don't have the resilience to go back and ask someone else, you're going to see this as something that's might not be as useful. But if you're taking a hundred meetings over the course of a school holiday. Um, and 10 of them generally, like, I think a one in 10 hit rate is generally quite, um, usual, um, like to finish a school holiday with 10 people or finish a break with 10 people that are quality connections that really care about you, your journey and your work and will help you, uh, towards fulfilling your goals. Um, that's a, that, that, that's pretty fantastic, but taking a hundred meetings is not easy. Trying no. to find a hundred people to take a meeting is not easy. Um, so like it, it totally is worth it. And as you said, making it easy, like I will come to you, I will bring coffee to you. I will work around your timings, yeah. your locations, um, and dates. You make it so easy. It's very hard to say no. In fact, yeah. you don't want to say no. Um, I want to I learn from you as well. Rub their ego. Exactly. Like, be, be curious. I think that's a big word. Be genuinely curious in this person. And because you're young, like honestly, at my, I'm 23 years old. I don't even think the strategy would work for me anymore. People would probably think I have some sort of agenda. But if you're 16 years old or 18, they're like some, a 16 year old kid reached out asking to grab coffee with me. That is incredible. As you mentioned before, and I say this all the time, people want to help young people. Absolutely. And like, just on that, like, I agree. I think even it gets harder as you get older, right? Um, like not impossible. It just gets no, harder. Of course not. Um, and the way in which you get those meetings, like I now, like with uh, some of our international programs, um, it's so much harder for me to get meetings when I was 14 and traveling. Like it was easy for me to get <laughs> yeah. meetings with any minister or um, corporate representative I needed to because it was a novelty like what 14 year old wants to meet me at my office with a proposal but as you get older like it, it is harder but as long as you like in your message um like I almost stalk people before every single meeting I have a very good understanding of who I'm meeting where they live where what their kids names are how old their kids are what kid like to the point I'm almost stalking these people beforehand yeah um messaging people I've got mutual connections with and asking how do you know them is there anything you can tell me about them? Like it is, it is borderline stalkerish. Um, but when I go to the meeting, I'm able to specifically uh, talk about areas that I can help them with and vice versa areas that I need help with as well. And just yeah. making sure you spend that meeting prep that if you're going to ask 10 people for a meeting, don't just come to that meeting with no meeting prep, like know these people from inside out. Um, because yeah. Yeah, at the, at the start and you're like, oh, how's your kid? Um, who, it, like it, it, it can be quite odd initially. Um, but after that, they, it, in almost all occasions, I don't think I've had one occasion where someone said this is just downright weird. Um, but yeah. they respect the idea that you've done your research. And it's easy. We live in a digital economy. It is easy to find people. Well, people like people like themselves. That's a great communication quote. And so if you can find ways to build rapport with them. So if you research someone and you go, oh, they're into the footy. What team do they follow? Oh, Rabbitohs. I used to follow the Rabbitohs. Bang. I'll subtly bring that up in conversation. I did it with you earlier about Harvey. I, I told you I met Harvey. We both know Harvey. Bang. A little bit of a mutual connection there. You, met, you probably trusted me a little bit more because you knew, you know, I knew someone. And that's what we teach at Empower You. I'm sure that's what you teach with your workshops as well. And that's just, you know, that's just basic communication skills. And in my look, there's a lot of stuff I'm passionate about. I don't know if I'd say this is number one. It'd be close to number one would be communication skills. Like if you've got communication, if that's the only skill you have in life, you're going to go very far. And what is a skill that machines can't replicate? As yes. we enter an innovation economy, uh, coding, computer programming, any or well, anything that can be systematized down to a series of sequential and logical steps can and will be automated. 
what can't be automated? It's people skills, human yeah. to human connection. A machine will never be able to public speak. A machine will never be able to negotiate. Communication skills really are the ultimate people skill. And as we enter the workforce of the future, this is what employers are looking for. Yeah. Uh, they can get machines to, to do all of these technical skills, but they need people to make connections with other people. Um, yeah. So if you can show and practice your communication skills in the classroom, you can't learn communication from a textbook. You learn communication through experimentation, learning through experimentation. And if you can experiment in your time in the classroom by jumping on stage and doing all of those public speaking occasions at school, trust me, you'll be so much more equipped when you finish school or finish university because that's what that initial 0 to 17, 17 to 21 year old age group is for. It's time. It, this is the time for experimenting. Oh, I mean, that's one of the key for the gap year program. I say experiment, experience and explore. You know, that's like, this is what you should be doing when you're young, experimenting, experiencing and exploring. It's like, it's a perfect window because now you've got the, the consequences if you fail are very low because you're still living at home, etc. But yeah, I mean, to add to that conversation, creativity, you know, machines aren't going to take take over creativity anytime soon the digital economy you know we're looking at a new world of communicators and create creatives so it's a very exciting world to me because that's kind of the world i'm in and they are important skills you should be developing and as you mentioned get a, it's uncomfortable communication skills is supposed to be uncomfortable it's hard to get up on stage and that's why i'm really i always suggest people start a podcast not to grow an audience you're probably not going to grow an audience it is unbelievably hard to grow a podcast independently but you're going to get a network with people the number one, you're going to get meet cool people, just like your coffee example, and you're going to rapidly grow your communication skills because you're going to be talking and you know communicating with these people. And so regardless if anyone listens to your show, it's going to be beneficial. Awesome, man. Well, I mean, let's go back to the micro business thing because I think that's really tangible and I'd love people to start it. I love the idea of it. You used a few examples. Do we have any more examples that we can just pull out of a hat to help people kind of conceptualize what you're talking about we had dog walking we had you know your tech blog we had okay you know people need more babysitters obviously starting a business is just solving a problem so what is a problem that you can solve like what are your students doing yeah definitely like um so just last week we were running this retreat with a group of kids and we've got two boys george and carter um who are the founders of the epac um and queensland's just implemented our single-use plastics ban and i assume the rest of the states will slowly follow um if they're not uh, up to our level already. Um, and George and Carter started um, the EPAC, which is the world's first tourist sustainability kit. Um, so you get a coconut bowl, you get like a spork that's made of a coconut, um, a heap of like things that uh, reduce the, the reliance on single use plastic. Um, and these, like these are eight year old boys. Um, and they <laughs> pitched this idea to us a couple of years ago. Um, they ended up meeting, uh, we organized this event called the Minister's Climate Challenge, and they ended up pitching the EPAC to the former US Vice President Al Gore, um, and uh, they ended up commercializing it. They've made hundreds of thousands of dollars already um, in terms of uh, prize money, sales, uh, scholarships, pitch opportunities, ads, etc. cetera. Um, this is not a revolutionary idea. Um, yeah. There's always been, like coconut bowls aren't something new. A spork is not something new. Um, a reusable, like upcycling um, old cloth and turning it into a pool towel is not new. These are all existing concepts, but they put it all together and they've managed to distribute it uh, in and around coastal Queensland. Um, and they're actively changing uh, their community and stopping the reliance on single-use plastic. Um, they've not had to do any uh, manufacturing. They've not had to do any molds. They've just been repurposing existing items and putting it together. To me, that is an example of a fantastic micro-business where they're manufacturing locally, so they're supporting local business as well, uh, adding a margin um, and distributing it um, to, to their local community. It's making money, um, and these guys are um, actively solving climate change in their community, um, as well as making money for themselves and their community. Um, they've done really well. Obviously, meeting a former US vice president before you turn 10 years old is a pretty <laughs> remarkable achievement in itself. Um, but an example of a micro business that's just gone a bit bigger than themselves, um, wow. repurposing existing items um, and commercializing it. Um, we've had heaps of other young people that have done, like we've got these kids who are doing turf terminators in Townsville that realized in Townsville we don't have enough gardeners. Um, the cheapest gardener charged $50 an hour. 
And for young people to be making $50 an hour is nuts, right? Um, oh, like for a casual job um, to be making like even $20 an hour in school is incredible. Um, so these guys started um, Turf Terminators where instead of charging 50, they're charged 35 to 40 an hour, which is still significantly um, more than what a casual job would be, but less than what the market uh, was uh, was charging. And they've already made two, two and a half thousand dollars from Turf Terminators in Townsville, North Queensland. So ideas that probably aren't going to change the world, but they're solving problems in their local community. And if you solve yeah. problems on their local community and there's a market fit, you're going to make money. Um, you're going to make sales. You're going to make uh, connections. And ultimately, that can be the start of your entrepreneurial journey. Of course, if you've got an idea to change the world, fantastic, run with it. But if you're just dabbling in business, uh, this is an opportunity for you to get paid for um, starting a micro business. You'll learn skills um, and you'll uh, ultimately have uh, a, a cool micro business in your back pocket as well. Yeah. Also, keep in mind, anyone who's changed the world, they didn't set out to do that. You know, Steve Jobs didn't set out to start Apple to what it is today. He just wanted to start by solving one problem at a time. Same with me. I just started with my podcast. Now I've got multiple podcasts. Now I've got this Gapier project and all this, this books just come out and all this other stuff. I didn't go, I want to do all this. I just started with the podcast. You just started with a tech blog and look where it's turned into. And so I think even though you might have these huge ambitious ideas, the classic example is always Amazon started as a bookstore and now it's, you know, an everything store. And yeah. so... But, but how, even though you might have these huge ideas, remember that it's just by implementing and starting small, that is where the big ideas come and where it really happens. And so Turf Terminators, who knows what that turns into? In a few years, they, they, give, up, they give up on it and switch to something else. And then they, that goes even bigger or whatever. But I think this is such a good message. And if, imagine if every young person was starting a micro business and it's just you know them and their friends solving problems in the community, jumping on Facebook pages, whatever. Like that is so inspiring to me and so exciting that that could be the future of the next generations because that is where those skills come in and they develop all of that stuff, especially as we're entering an economy which looks like it's going to be more contract-based, more self-employed based as opposed to what it is now. Absolutely. And I, when we look at the gig economy in particular, um, that requires a portfolio of skills. Um, mm. You can't just say, uh, I've done a, I finished school with an, a, a great 99 ATAR, I've done a bachelor of business, now I'm the best person to run a business. You need a portfolio of skills. Running a micro business or running any business, um, even volunteering um, at a business, builds to your builds your portfolio of skills um, and at the very least builds your network. Um, so really, I, I think... Say I would even say if you if you just had a high market school and then got a business degree, that is almost a turn off for me. It's like you you don't want to start a business. If you wanted to start a business, you would have started one. It's like you yes. would have been doing it while you're young. That's not an entrepreneur mindset. If you're just you know, I, I I don't know. I'm I'm not I'm not a big believer in business degrees. I think you know if you want to be into management position and stuff, then maybe they're good. But there's this illusion that they're going to help you start a business. But no, and just start a micro business. For some careers, like when we, like I wouldn't feel comfortable if a, a, a medical practitioner operated on me without a degree. But oh, absolutely. some degrees, we need a degree. And I, I just feel a little more comfortable if my lawyer or my uh, GP had, had, a, had a degree. Um, but as you said, if for yeah. a business degree, um, is, there, is there not um, the skills they're training, uh, are they actually aligned to the needs of the real world? Uh, who knows? Um, yeah. And according to a recent OECD report, Australia comes in 33 out of 33 when it comes to the relationship between higher education and industry. So to me, that does speak uh, in research terms, um, whether we agree with that statement or not, um, in, just on in a black and white research point of view, to me, that speaks volumes about the disconnect between the skills that universities are teaching versus the needs of employers and the real world. Yeah. And it just blows my mind because like how much a uni degree, you're looking at like 30 grand for these skills. Imagine what you could do with 30 grand towards a business or to, to traveling or like there's so much more you could do with that. Yet they're getting these kind of outdated skills. And like even, you know, this book, I've, actually I've got it right here. I interviewed this woman. She did an, she's got a PhD in cognitive brain science and she's um, written an, an uh why schools fail to teach an analytical overview of the education system. And a study showed that Australia's education system in high school places 47 out of the 52 developed countries in the world. Wow, 47. that's inconvenient. Gosh. Like, that is unbelievable. And considering we're one of the wealthiest 
developed countries in the world. It's it's crazy. So stuff like this, in my opinion, is very needed. And I, it's it's cool. Like at your workshops, when you're doing a micro business, do that. What do you do? You just tell them what you're telling us now, and just get them inspired. Because I think one thing I would wanted to say after that story of the two boys who met the president. Isn't it crazy what people can achieve when they have a bit of support and guidance around them? It is unbelievable. Yeah, like success by association. You surround yourself with cool people. Some of that uh, awesomeness, coolness rubs off on you as well, Um, right? I think like I firmly believe that you've just got to put yourself out there. So just start, right? Inevitably, if you're you're actually passionate about it, you will find a way. Um, It might not be that business. It might not be that idea, but you will find a way. Um, Yeah have the passion take the action the magic has to happen um it's inevitable yeah and as we mentioned before it's never been easier to start a business or a micro business facebook groups allow instant marketing in your local area you can set up websites for like ten dollars a month you can set up you can set up everything so cheaply um you don't need to get you know a company you just get like an abn for 98 dollars, and you're good to go like it's so exciting to me it's like in in the previous generation like you they had like they had excuses to not start a business. For like sure. In, in some of them, like I, I agree that um, some of those excuses are, are reasonably uh, fair. Uh, right now, like there is literally every sort of reason that you couldn't start a business 10 years ago is gone. You can register a company online. If you don't know how to register a business, there's probably a free online course that teaches you how to register a business. Um, yep. Every single roadblock to starting a business uh, in my mind, has been alleviated. Um, unless you have explicitly a parent that blocks your Wi-Fi at home, or a school that doesn't have Wi-Fi uh, in in uh, like throughout the day, then I would tend to believe that you maybe have an excuse not to actively run your business. But in most cases, the reason you do not have a business if you want one is because you don't want one, not because the factors around you. Uh, restricting your ability, but because you don't want to, um, it's up to you um, yeah. to to make that decision. And if, when that mental switch says, "Yep, I'm uh, I'm ready," you will find a way. Um, but until that switch mm-hmm. goes from uh, balancing in the middle to um, yeah, like I actually really, really, really want to do it, um, then of course you will find a way. Yeah, I agree. Have you listened to Shoe Dog? the audiobook or the I haven't book. no so it's the the founder of Nike um, and my god you hear him how he started a business in the 1950s we're talking every single meeting so he imp- he began by importing shoes from Japan and then he would go to track the like the track and he would just sell them to athletes on the spot yeah right and so it wasn't it wasn't Nike for like the first like 5 to 10 years and um, he had to fly to Japan of course flights were like $2000 back then which is i don't even know like 10 grand today's money and it's, I remember listening to this going, holy crap, the amount of work and sacrifices he had to make to start a business, which, and everything he had to do is now obsolete. You could import shoes sitting in your room. You could import shoes from Japan from your computer. You could totally. have Zoom meetings with people from your computer, from a computer that costs you $300 from Facebook Marketplace. Like, it is so exciting to me. There's so much opportunity for young people to get out there. And I agree. The only reason you have a business is because you don't want one or you're not committed enough. And I recommend it. He, my mate, one of my best mates, he just started a board game. With him and his best mate, they've just started a board game together called Influencer. It's like taking the piss out of influencers. I've got like the, the, all the characters, the mummy blogger, the you know, the gym guy. And it's, it's yeah. really fun. And they've been developing a board game. And he's like, it's, it's taken our relationship to the next level. I'm addicted to it. It's so much fun. I'm having such, I'm designing. I've learned all these skills on design. I've got all this new software we're doing. And it's just like, yeah, because when you're doing, when you're solving a problem, that you are passionate about, it's going to give you a bit more purpose in life, which I think a lot of young people in high school are lacking right now. Totally. And even like, as we said before, like even if you don't, if your overall end goal is not to start a business, you will learn so damn much from this process. It's exhilarating. Like I've got the best job in the world. Like some yeah, days are hard. So, it's meant so to I. be hard, but it's the best job in the world and I would never trade it for, mo- well, okay, maybe there is one thing I want, but um, I wouldn't, there's, there's not a lot I would trade it for. Um, it, it really is the best job in the entire world. Yeah. And it's because you're giving back and that's where like empower you is such an incredible event. It's exhausting, but like seeing the change in the kids faces and you know, that's so rewarding to you. It's one of the, mm. you know, the six human needs. I'm sure you've heard of the six human needs. Um, you know, when you're looking for work, look for the six human needs, not for money. Of course, yeah. money is important. 
Um, but once you've got a good financial understanding, um, it, it, there's so much more to that. And yeah, it's very, very exciting. I hope people listening to this are inspired to start a business. As we mentioned, it doesn't have to be a huge commitment like, oh, I'm going to start a business. It's like, what is a problem that I can solve? Just ask yourself that question. What is a small problem I can solve? I know lots and lots of people, um, maybe not where you are, but in Sydney because of lockdown have started crocheting, you know, like crocheting. <laughs> yeah. Like my mum and my sister are doing it. My friends yeah, are doing right. it. Create clothes. Micro business. Ex- Sell yeah, making a marketplace Etsy store. and no commission. Go, yeah, yeah. Etsy store and start selling them. Create, create mm-hmm. a TikTok account. Start promoting through TikTok. Um, you know, there's so many different things you can be doing and there's really no excuse. I'm actually pretty sure Australia is the... To literally set up a company, which you don't have to do, but like to set up a company, I think Australia is the cheapest country in the world. Like in Germany, Sweet. it's like 20, 20 grand to set up a company, but in Australia, it's like $1,100. And even if you don't want to set up, right? Like you could literally just be trade, like in, hopefully no one from the ATO seasons, but <laughs> like, like, like you can start, like you will learn from just selling a few hundred dollars of stock as a hobby on Facebook Marketplace, like build stuff, even if it's just buying things on Facebook Marketplace, fixing them up and then selling them. Yeah. Um, like seriously, there's a business there. Um, you're not going to make millions or, okay, you might, but you're probably not going to make millions of dollars from this, but you can make a few hundred dollars a week. You can make a few thousand dollars a week, pick up things mm. for free, pick up things for $10, like clean it, uh, dust it off a little, repaint it and sell it for a few hundred. Like this is practical. This is easy. This is easy to do. You will yeah. learn from this. Um, but it like the ball is in your court. There is no one like, there's no real reason why you anyone in this day and age can't do this Hmm. take responsibility if you want to do it do it don't worry about what people say and i will add a little disclaimer here and i'll be curious to hear what you think because i know in this conversation people are going to be like all right how do i start a business and they're going to come across stuff like drop shipping amazon fba (laughs) affiliate links and everything which are all kind of get they all they all have these massive promises of making millions of dollars and it's very exciting for a young person my advice is ignore that and just do what we've been doing. Find a problem in your local area. Find tangible stuff that isn't going to make you millions, but it's going to make you a hundred bucks a week, you know, two hundred bucks a week, fifty bucks on a weekend. Like, and and and, and, and do it with your friends because then you're hanging out, you're bonding, you're having fun, and you're making money at the same time. How awesome is that? And like, honestly, the things they teach you in some of these courses, like you can learn this stuff like directly, like yeah. if, if these people who were selling you the courses were actually making as much money as they say they did, they wouldn't be yeah. teaching you. Um, yeah. Like <laughs> every YouTube video you watch, you see someone selling you an e-commerce course. Like yeah. if if you're actually passionate to the point you're going to pay for some of these courses, just invest that money into yourself. Um, yes. Same thing as you said about university. If you're really passionate about starting a business, don't do a business, well, maybe don't do a business degree. We've actually just been sponsored by a university, but um, maybe don't do a business degree. Um, but do both. Maybe invest you can, that you money. Can both. Into, you can. You can. Um, if, you, if you want to, you can do a micro business and have a business degree like, and build your brand at the same time. Like the average university degree is 15 to 20 hours a week. The average. You've got heaps of time. Yeah. If you're an architect or an engineer, then maybe it's you know, 30, 35 a week. But the average university degree is 15 to 20 hours a week. So you've got, all, you've got a whole another 20 hours and you're doing a full working week to, you know, I mean, hang out, work part-time, start a business. Like you can be doing both. I think there's a lot you can be doing during your degree if you want to do a business degree. Absolutely. Awesome, man. Well, look, this has been a fun conversation. I've loved it. I think hopefully people have got motivated. I do, yeah, really listen to what I just said. Don't go away and go find all these courses and pay lots of money for them. Just start a business. Everything you need to do, learn is for free. Or, you know, as both of I, we both work with Student Edge um, and they've got, this is actually the sponsor of this of this episode and, you know, we're partnered up and they offer you know, for like, I think it's like 98 bucks and you get full access to the course and I've got all this training of which you're one of them. Did you want to give us a quick rundown of like, what do you teach in this course? Is it kind of what you've just been talking about? Exactly. So we've kind of put together like a taster course um, for Student Edge of how to start a side hustle. So if you're actually keen on starting a business, just jump onto Student Edge Plus um, and like, like there's some really cool courses and I think um, Byron, there's actually a, a communication one on there as well. So from starting a business to learning how to communicate, you'll actually have like a whole path of uh, really, really cool training along the way as well. And um, even if you don't want to do some e-learning, like you can get a free drink, just sign up, right? You get a free yeah, I mean, McDonald's. 
Yeah, I mean, they have Student Edge have all these like um, Boba Tea as a partner. You can get like free Boba Teas. You can um, get all these discounts. You can also get paid to partic- participate in surveys. So there's a good way to get paid. Like, and they're just really cool guys. And you know, I had a little insight to the future over the next year, and they are doing a lot next year. So yeah, definitely get involved with them. And if you want to learn more from Taj, like there's so much you can do. Just Google his name. But we'll talk about that at the end. Uh, but before we wrap up, Taj, I always ask one uh, one final question to every guest and Feel free to take your time with it because it's a big one. What would be your number one piece of advice to an 18-year-old today? Say yes to everything and meet everyone. Um, I always said yes to everything growing up. Um, Like, sorry, okay. In school, I always used to say no. Like, I, I really didn't enjoy school. I, especially, well, primary school I didn't enjoy, but um in, when you enter the real world, just say yes to everything. If someone asks you to go out to an event, say yes. If someone asks you for a meeting, say yes. Um, like you'll just come across some really interesting uh, experiences and people. Um, and when you're young, like the opportunity cost is quite low. Um, mm. Like it's not like when you get older, I'm sure the opportunity cost rises and it does rise. Um, but when you're 18, just say yes to everything. Even if it's a waste of time or one of, one of those things you say yes to is a waste of time, fine. I'm sure at least you've identified one place you don't want to go to or be like uh, in the future, but just say yes to everything. Um, Dude, I couldn't agree more. You know, that movie, Yes Man from Jim Carrey, I love it. Like it's such, you know, go watch that movie. It's, it's all about a guy who has to say yes to everything and it's a comedy, but I was in the same when I was young I, and to, almost to my detriment. Like I just, I took on too much and I kept saying, but like, I wouldn't take it back. Just say yes to everything that comes across you because you never know what it's going to turn into. And our burnout threshold is quite is significantly lower, right? Like it's, 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 it's like significantly higher than that of an, an adult. Like when, when you're an adult, you're going to be thinking about your finances. You're going to be yeah. thinking about your kids. You're going to be thinking about paying off your hex debt. You're going to be thinking about all these adulting things that will come up when, when you're older. Um, even if you take on a bit too much, you, 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 we're able to handle a bit more. Um, yeah. Like I think um, like just a bit of exercise um, can bring, uh, bring us back into a check. Whereas when you're older, like things are going to hit, hit you. And actively, like I, I'm only 22 now. But I was able to uh, take on far more when I was 18 than I am right now. Um, I mm. was in a far more better place to handle multi- travel, work, staff, growing a business, scaling a business when I was 18, mm. not from a, like a worldly wise point of view, but just from a, a, from a mental well-being point of view, I felt I had the capacity when I was 18 um, well, to say yes. Heard of- You've heard of that thing, right, where it's like when you're young, you've got time, energy, but no money. And when you're like middle age, um, you've got money, um, energy, but no time. And when you're old, you've got uh, time, money, but no energy. And that's Mm. like play into those strengths. When you're young, you've got time and energy. So use them. I'm the same. Like I used to do, I used to do one-on-one Zoom calls with my listeners when they reached out um, if they wanted to. I haven't done that in a while. It's just not practical for me. I don't have time as much as I love to do it. And if someone was really desperate, I probably would. But I used to do heaps and I just don't mm. have time now. And there's so many other things because I've got heaps going on. And so, yeah, take advantage of your youth. People want to help you when you're young and you've got the time and energy. So, you know, give it a shot. So, yes, like the number of things that have just come through our door from just saying yes, whether it be uh, meetings with former U.S. vice presidents. Um, there was, we were in... Uh, internationally we were traveling with westpac and that was from a chance encounter and we bumped into will smith and we had breakfast and that was a chance encounter by just saying yes to a trip two years before that um and you just like this world is exciting you'll meet some really exciting interesting people you will make some incredible memories but yeah. if you just say yes this will all happen um yeah once you start saying no your network your experiences start slowing down so just say yes just say yes to everything. You don't want to go to that party. Just say yes. What are you going to do? Just sit at home and do nothing. Like always, I think that's a good one. The opportunity cost when you're young is huge because it's like, what are you going to do instead? Probably not much. Whereas when you're older, it might be something else. You've got to look after the kids or whatever. So it's like, just say yes. I couldn't agree more. But um, anyways, man, thank you so much for coming on. 
Um, obviously, guys, go check out Student Edge, um, sign up to there, and you can get access to Taj's course as well as heaps of other courses and discounts and all these other benefits. But if people want to get in touch with you, if they want to come check out your business, Australian School of Entrepreneurship, um, is it only Australians that have access to it? I know I have a lot of international listeners as well. We d- so it's called the ASC Group. We've um, it's open to our online education is open to everyone. It's free. Um, so it's just asc.edu.au or jump on Instagram, just my full name, Taj Pabari. Yep, and all the links will be down below. But Taj, thanks so much for coming on and I look forward to working together in the future. Cheers, mate.